Hi, I'm WTOP film critic Jason Fraley, and all month long we're ranking the best movies in every genre. 30 genres over 30 days, and today we're breaking down my top 25 politics and media movies. Now, of course, it's broken down into politics and media. So first of all, let's talk about the political movies. Which ones of those come? Well, the first one that comes to my mind is Frank Capra's 1939 classic, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Um, there's a, you'll see there's a lot of cynical movies that I'm about to talk about later on the list. Um, but the reason I wanted this one high, including in the top five, is because it's the opposite of that. It's the most idyllic, uh, you know, uh, the idealism of Jimmy Stewart coming from the country. Oh, we're going to start a boys club in D.C. It's just so great. And he gets here and he looks at the Capitol dome and he says you know always my father always said look at life like you're coming out of a tunnel and the great filibuster I mean come on Mr. Smith goes to Washington is quintessential um, American political movies um, then we get some more political thrillers and a little more cynical ones um, like John Frankenheimer's Seven Days in May, or which I also think is his better, his best one, The Manchurian Candidate. You'll still hear that reference today when people are talking about political traitors and things. The Manchurian Candidate is unbelievable the way that Frankenheimer directs it. I get Angela Lansbury um, playing her solitaire, doing the brainwashing with the solitaire, which she's so creepy, long before Mrs. Potts and Beauty and the Beast. If you loved her there, check out the Manchurian Candidate. And you have Frank Sinatra, Janet Lee. It's just a great cast. Um, um, and it actually kind of eerily foreshadowed, because it came out in 1962, eerily foreshadowed the Kennedy assassination in 1963, literally the year later, um, because this one ends with a big uh, political assassination too. Um, but to me, the best part of the movie is the opening sequence when it intercuts from, uh, it's the brainwashing sequence where you, it looks like they're in a, an old lady's gardening meeting, and but really that's just what they're envisioning. Really, as the camera rotates in that 360, um, they're actually um, getting brainwashed. Um, so it's a really fascinating opening. Um, we also get uh, Z and The Conformist. Um, well, Z is the Costa Gavras from Greece. The Conformist is Bernardo Bertolucci, uh, his Italian masterpiece, um, anti-fascist uh, treatise there with some of the best cinematography I've ever seen. Um, and then we also, you know, we get some lighter ones like The American President, um, which is sort of a rom-com, but it's politic, po po politics here, so we put it there. And then, of course, Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, the ultimate, it's a political satire. Um, you might not totally appreciate it if you see it too young, but I promise the older you get and the more politically minded you'll get, you'll appreciate the satire of Peter Sellers playing three roles, especially um, uh, the title character, Dr. Strangelove, where he can't, he can't control his arm doing the Heil, and, um, or, but just George C. Scott talking about, oh, we'll kill 20 to 30 million people, depending on the bricks, or Sterling Hayden with his precious bodily fluids, and of course Slim Pickens riding the nuclear bomb down uh, like a cowboy. Um, Kubrick was... Uh, I think it's he did a lot of serious stuff, but this was his definitely his funniest. We put that in with the politics. So that was the politics movies. Now here we have the journalism movies. Yes, there's a lot of crossover, but this is the one. This is where everyone here, especially in a newsroom like WTOP, where we win Edward R. Murrow's. We like movies about Edward R. Murrow, uh, like Good Night and Good Luck. Uh, George Clooney's directorial effort, um, starring David Strathairn as Edward R. Murrow um, um, during those great um, CBS evening broadcasts where they exposed McCarthyism and really um, showed him for what he really was, a uh, charlatan uh, with those blacklists. Uh, it's a great movie, black and white, but it's a great, great movie. We get other ones that are a little lighter, like Howard Hawks' His Girl Friday, the ultimate newspaper screwball comedy with Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell. It originally came out earlier in the 30s as the front page, and it was two dudes in a newsroom, but what's cool about this is Howard Hawks, they flip it around in 1940 and they had Rosalind Russell take over one of the roles and do it as a, you know, um, I guess her and Cary Grant are our recent divorcees and he's trying to get her to stick around but also she's such a strong newspaper woman that she wants to stick around. His Girl Friday, the fastest, most hilarious dialogue you'll see in any newspaper movie. We get ones from 87, 1987, like Broadcast News. Uh, you know, if His Girl Friday was the funny newspaper movie, this is the funny TV movie. Um, that inspired Anchorman and so many other ones. I'm Ron Burgundy. But Broadcast News is James L. Brooks, one of his best ones. Um, you have Albert Brooks sweating bullets uh, on screen, William Hurt, um, Holly Hunter. It's, it's just classic. But the best scene is Joan Cusack sprinting across the newsroom to get the, the tape in um, uh, right before the deadline. It's just classic uh, broadcast journalism stuff. Um, we also get newer ones like The Post, Steven Spielberg's movie, um, where Meryl Streep plays Kay Graham, the female publisher of The Post. Some feminist moments there. Um, Tom Hanks plays Ben Bradley. Not, not, not as good as, I mean, Jason Robards in All the President's Men. How do you compare that? We'll get to that in a minute. 
Um, but it's, I thought it was still a pretty good movie. A little tidy, but all about the Pentagon Papers, sort of a prequel to the Watergate stuff of all the President's Men. We get some Spotlight, of course, Best Picture winner from 2015. Um, a little bit of the underdog movie that could. Everyone out in the Oscars, I remember backstage, they were like, oh, The Revenant's going to win everything. Leo won Best Actor. It's going to win. And I was like, I think Spotlight's going to take it because the script is much better. Revenant wasn't even directed. And boom, Spotlight wins. It's all about the Catholic um, sexual child abuse uh, scandal within the Catholic Church. A true story based on the Boston Globe Spotlight investigative team. Um, and just the cast in this. Mark Ruffalo and Leah Schreiber and Michael Keaton and Rachel McAdams. I mean, look at that cast. And I just love it. So they pound the pavement and do some old school reporting there. Um, we get the really cynical Ace in the Hole by Billy Wilder, which um, is about a miner that gets trapped in a cave, and Kirk Douglas is this reporter who sees his big break, He's but he's going to make it so that the miner doesn't get out as early as he could. He's like, let's see how long can we delay this dig so that I can have front page stories for a couple weeks. And tragically, as you could imagine, maybe you shouldn't manipulate the news, which also brings us into Nightcrawler. Um, Jake Gyllenhaal, you, you think of it as kind of a thriller, but it's totally a media movie. It's that whole idea, it bleeds, it leads. That caution tape you see on the local news that I hate. Please, local news, if you're watching, stop doing it. I hate it. I, maybe it gets good ratings. I don't know, but it's so, it dumbs us down. Report some more good news. Um, or at least balance it out. We don't have to have it bleeds, it leads. But here Jake Gyllenhaal is this videographer for the local news, and he starts, I'm going to manipulate the news a little. I'm going to maybe move the body a little better so I get a better shot. And then, oh, if I got away with that, I'm going to manipulate it a little more. And by the end, it's just, it's pretty horrific. Um, and then, of course, a face in the crowd. Elia Kazan's uh, it really prescient, kind of warning about the power of, of TV. We have Andy Griffith, who we think is, you know, <laughs> you know, you think of the happy TV show, but here he is a loudmouth charlatan, Lonesome Rhodes, who goes from this you know, kind of a, a just an unknown country bumpkin, used TV as a megaphone and starts to get eyed for a political run. Um, pretty much I think, predicted the rise of a lot of these TV politicians, whether no matter what side of the aisle you're on. I mean, I guess if you want to say, you know, Kennedy kind of rose to TV, Reagan, of course. And then the ultimate example, probably the most like Lonesome Roads, is Donald Trump. So I think A Face in the Crowd was way ahead of its time um, in predicting a lot of uh, TV's power um, on the journalism side. Now, speaking of the power of television, number three is a no-brainer for me. Network, written by Patty Chayefsky, uh, one of the greatest Oscar-winning scripts of all time. Seriously, I put it in my maybe top five, top ten scripts ever. If you go look at all these speeches, they're so amazing. Uh, directed by Sidney Lumet, I also think it's his best movie after all the other great ones he made from 12 Angry Men, just to Dog Day Afternoon, everything. Network is his crowning achievement. And I think it's because it predicted the rise of 24-7 cable news and how it can be used almost to brainwashing effect. You know, whether you're a Fox News hater or an MSNBC hater, CNN, pick your poison. Um, but it really showed how this guy at the megaphone, these talking heads, how we're getting away from the idea of actually reporting straight news, kind of like the good night and good luck Edward R. Murrow's of the, of the old days or the Ro Walter Cron Cronkite's that we were talking about earlier. This movie through Peter Finch's role as Howard Beale when he goes on and says, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. Everyone get up, rise out your windows and you scream it. And they go and they actually look out the windows and everyone in the town is shouting that. It just goes to show how almost like lemmings, we're, we follow along these talking heads on cable news. And this was in the 70s. This was way, like decades before even, you know, CNN launched and all Fox News and all these other things launched. This was way ahead of its time predicting this and I think warning us. And there's, of course, Howard Beale, Peter Finch, he, he won a posthumous Oscar because he died before the movie even came out. And uh, there's that scene where before he goes and makes his big speech, it's almost like he, he has a, a, visiting, a visit from, uh, from beyond and has this epiphany and he's like, and then he goes and does his Mad as Hell speech. But knowing that he died before, <laughs> before he won his Oscar, before the movie came out, I almost, it, call me crazy, I almost think something from beyond had touched into this and was like, this movie's gonna warn you guys and then he's gonna die. But this movie's gonna warn you guys. Of course, we also get William Holden um, in one of his better roles later in years. And he has that big speech um, where he's having the affair with Faye Dunaway and he, he leaves her and calls her television incarnate. She's too wrapped up in it. But then because of the affair, his, his wife, uh, a really small role, won Best uh, Supporting Actress for about like a 10 minute scene, uh, calling him out on his affair. Faye Dunaway is so good in this too, and you know, oh, we struck the mother load. She's great. Um, it's just one of the most, and then Robert Duvall, I mean, it's, it's stacked. Um, uh, 
so many people, Ned Beatty. It is an unbelievable piece of work, way ahead of its time. Check it out. Network, cynical, powerful, prescient. Number two. So Network was the t best TV movie. All the President's Men, number two on the newspaper side. Of course you could have put this number one. When, you, when I get to one, you'll see you know, what I put there. But man, All the President's Men, I absolutely love this movie. It inspired so many of us uh, in the newsroom. Like I'm sure you could count heads around here, everyone's sitting around the camera now, um, of how many people were inspired to go into journalism uh, because of All the President's Men. You have Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman as Woodward and Bernstein. Woodstein! Um, basically uncovering Watergate and bringing down a president. Um, and it, the cool thing about this movie was it happened, uh, the movie came out just after Nixon had resigned. I mean, the movie is 76, um, and so Watergate was literally just a couple years earlier. And so, but what I love about it is a lot of filmmakers, especially now in the blockbuster era, even look at The Post, which I, is, a, is a great movie, but it's more in the middle of the pack, because I think a lot of movies now would over explain and uh, they would stick around a little too long maybe. Whereas All the President's Men is all about their dogged reporting, building up the reporting, reporting over the years. And, and then at the end, we don't need to see Nixon resign. We don't need to see all the aftermath and all the hand holding that, you know, maybe like a more Spielbergian movie. No, Pakula, um, working from a William Goldman script, just ends with the teletype saying, you know, so-and-so resigns, so-and-so resigns, so-and-so resigns, and now Nixon resigns and Typewriter sound, cut to black. Um, but it's also a great political thriller. Um, yeah, we get Ben Bradley um, um, per portrayed by an Oscar winning Jason Robards, where he said, you know, they show up at his door in the middle of the night and he says, nothing's riding on this except, you know, the uh, First Amendment to the, the Constitution and freedom of the press. And you're like, oh, wow, talk about stakes in a movie. Um, but I mean, we already knew how it was going to end, and yet they get such drama and thriller out of it. That is masterful to me. And of course, Robert Redford in those parking garage scenes um, with Deep Throat and those lines, you know, follow the money, and they're in the shadows, and you can just see his little cigarette lit. It is just quintessential, the ultimate journalism movie. Good luck making a better one. But as much as I love Network and All the President's Men, my number one slot, again, sort of the default answer. It's the Citizen Kane of movies. Citizen Kane. And literally people say, the Citizen Kane of blank in whatever you're ranking. Um, I put it number one. It is, I gotta say, if you see it when you're too young, I'll admit, I'll admit, like all you guys, I fell asleep watching it in high school. You know, you see it on number one on best lists ever, the AFI's top movie ever, and you're like, oh, I'm so excited to see this. And you watch it, and if you're like too young for it, you're like, what? I don't get it. Then all of a sudden you watch it again, you watch it again. You will have an epiphany if you start to look every shot by this boy genius prodigy, 26 years old at the time, Orson Welles, who stars in the movie as well and wrote it <laughs> and directed it. Um, you'll notice that every shot has a symbolic idea and that's why it's held up. Not only for the script that fractured the narrative and moves it around and tells you everything that happens before um, the movie starts, uh, before All About Eve and Pulp Fiction and other movies were moving the pieces around, Memento, all that stuff, Citizen Kane was the first that's like, I'm moving everything around. I mean, you get the Rosebud mystery, of course, which it's not like a shocker like The Sixth Sense where you're like, oh my God, I have to watch it again. No, it's more of a when they say, hey, it's a sled. I think it almost is better. I'd rather have the spoiler for this movie because I think it's better knowing that. You see all the times that the sled and the idea of him just wanting to go back to his childhood. You know, he's amassed all of these possessions over his lifetime. Warehouses full in Xanadu in his big mansion. But at the end, it's just, he can't buy happiness. In the end, he's, he, he just wants that childhood sled. And back when he was with his mom before he was taken away with Mr. Thatcher, there's that scene where he actually has the rosebud, the sled, trying to push Thatcher away. And it obviously falls and gets buried in snow. But if you really think about, it's the ideas. We see the snow globe, you know, when he says Rosebud and it smashes. You think we're in the snow globe, but then the camera pulls out and it's still snowing. So now we're in his mind. It's, it's, a, it's a supernatural, it's a, a figurative snow. There's ideas like that through the whole movie. Case in point, final point, the, I, I really want to hammer down the idea that, that every shot has a symbolic meaning. So there's, let's say there's a scene when Charles Foster came um, is uh, someone's reading a contract that says he has to relinquish a certain number of his newspaper publications around the country. 
someone in the foreground is reading that contract and you see Orson Welles get really, really small in the distance. Like imagine, you know, if you see someone far down the street, they get really, really small because he's feeling small. The person in the contract saying, you're forfeiting your rights to these publications. He gets so small in the very deep background. They even made the, they designed the set windows super big. So he's getting really small in the background. And then when, right when they get to a clause in the contract that says, oh wait, there's an amendment here. There's a clause where you get to maintain a little more power over this one part. He, that's the exact moment he turns around and starts getting really big, really big, really big in the shot. So if you didn't get it the first time, or if you just think, oh, it's technically groundbreaking with the deep focus photography that allows you to see foreground, middle ground, background, uh, Greg Toland, great work. It's more than just technologically groundbreaking and historically. Those tools are used symbolically in every shot, like you know, getting bigger, getting smaller. I promise you, if you look at every shot, there's something that this whiz kid is up to thematically, symbolically in every shot. And to me, that is why it continues to top all the lists. It's for, I think Scorsese said in the AFI countdown, it's because it teaches us a different way to look at movies through the cinematic eye. And it, honestly, if you look at it in that light, um, it kind of puts every other movie to shame because a lot of people focus, focus on the surf, surface story, which is absolutely important. But no one goes the lengths that Wells did to make every image, every character layout in the shot, the camera moving through things like tables. That if you really look at it, like, how did that do that? It's because Wells made every shot symbolic. Citizen Kane, some people say it's the greatest movie of all time, but to me, in the politics and media category, definitely Citizen Kane, number one political media movie. See my full top 25 politics and media movies on WTOP.com's entertainment page. Join the blog and let us know what you think. And join us tomorrow as we break down my favorite prison flicks.